Good afternoon. Welcome to the first offline Paraspar lecture organized by the Office of Communication, Indian Institute of Science. Paraspar is an initiative of the Office of Communication that provides a platform for conversations on knowledge systems. Besides the bi-monthly uh, lecture series, we also organize standalone uh, special lectures. Today's lecture is one such special event. Today we are glad to have Professor Viran Murthy to speak about his latest book, The Politics of Time in China and Japan, Back to the Future. Before we begin, let me give you a brief introduction of the speaker today. Professor Viran Murthy is Professor of History at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He teaches uh, transnational Asian history and researches Chinese and Japanese intellectual history. His work probes the historical conditions for the possibility of philosophy and politics in the modern world and in East Asia in particular. His general interest is in the attempt to is, is, the, is in the attempt of East Asian intellectuals to resist modernity through reviving pre-modern philosophies and religions such as Buddhism. His other works uh, include uh, co-audited work uh, Confronting Capital and Empire, Rethinking Kyoto School Philosophy, published in 2017, East Asian Marxism, Marxisms and Their uh, Trajectories, uh, published in 2017, and his latest book, The Politics of Time of, in China and Japan, Back to the Future, published last year, 2000, in 2022. We are very glad to have you, have you Professor Murthy. Uh, may I invite you for the lecture? Thanks. And may I also tell the audience that after the lecture, we have a small, uh, we have organized a tea. Please have the tea and go. Um, thank, thank you, you very, very much, much for that introduction, Batista. Uh, and uh, it's great to be back here. Um, I haven't been here for, I think, three years or so um, because of the, of the pandemic. Um, and let me just get started. Okay, um, so as you can see, I've um, changed the title a little bit. I'm still using Back to the Future. But I'm going to focus on um, a particular chapter in the, uh, in the book called, um, which is really about rethinking Tianxia. Tianxia uh, in Chinese means all under heaven. And so I'm looking at that philosophy um, in light of Marxism in sort of both China and interwar Japan. Um, so today my talk will be set, divided into these parts. So first I'll have an introduction, then um, a discussion of some of the transformations in Chinese nationalism. So we often talk about Chinese nationalism, but we don't often think about how these national, how, how nationalism in China changed over the years. And that's what I'll be focusing on. Um, then I'll be looking sort of in a related vein um, at the problem of universalisms in China, right? One of the things I'm going to talk about is how in China there's been a universalist kind of term. Um, then we get to what may be the, the two sort of more philosophical parts of the talk, uh, the more difficult parts for some, um, also interesting for others. But uh, one is about the whole problem of ontology in uh, Tianxia theory. That'll make more sense once we get to that um, part. And then I'll do a quick summary of um, something that I discuss at, in more le at more length in the chapter of the book, and that is this comparison between Lao Tzu, a very famous, uh, well-known um, traditional Chinese philosopher, and Hegel and their, con their conceptions of the one-many. Um, then. I get to the problem that I think a lot of people have been thinking about quite a bit, and that is the problem of whether China is going to be imperialist, right? Uh, that's one of the fears that we often have when we talk about China's um, attempts to think of a new world order or something, is, is China going to be imperialist? Um, and here, this is where the Japanese mirror, I think, is important. Because if we think about the 30s and 40s in Japan, the Japanese were also saying, we're going to come up with a different world order and all of this, but that was all connected to Japanese imperialism. So the question we're going to have to ask is, is China doing something similar today? Right? And that's one of, one of the things I'm going to end with. Uh, 
Um, and could China do something else, right? And that's going to be the other kind of hypothetical question. Um, and then the final part is going to be looking at kind of Marxist criticisms of this whole Qian Xiao theory, um, which has been, uh, has recently come to the fore. Um, and then I'll end with some conclusions. So a lot to cover. Um, you know, I may not be able to go into great detail in each of these sections. Um, and so I'd be happy to take questions afterwards. So the first question, will China be imperialist? Um, and this, this is really the question um, around a lot of, if we think about Chen Xia discourse, as we'll see, Chen Xia discourse is really a group of Chinese intellectuals saying that, you know, we've got to bring back the older theory of uh, Chen Xia, all under heaven like China before, and that will be a better world order, right? And the minute people hear that, especially around Asia, a lot of people think, oh, oh, this is, this sounds like imperialism. And this is where we have the Belt Road Initiative, for example, um, looks like it could be, some people see it as imperialism. Um, some people also, but the Chinese want to say, no, 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 it's resistance against imperialism, right? Because it's resistance against American imperialism. And this is why the Japanese world sort of um, kind of example is, is, is quite interesting because the Japanese were also like, yeah, we're resisting imperialism. And this is where, this is an, another book that I'm finishing um, on Pan-Asianism, which largely deals with Japan, deals with a thinker named Takeuchi Yoshimi, who says, you know, J Japanese imperialism is really an imperialism against imperialism, right? That's what he was trying to say. Now the question is, are we saying something similar? Are, so, are we seeing something similar with respect to China? Now with China, it's much more difficult to talk about because a lot of these projects are just in their initial stages. Um, so we, you know, it's, it's sort of something we have to think about. Um, now, of course, in India as well, we see this, this kind of discourse coming up again, right? And this is actually from a very recent article. I think it was even just in the paper today where you have, oh, oh, wait a second, China is now in some sense imperialist and also, you know, uh, threatening, threatening India, right? Um, in fact, from this same article, um, which, which uh, is actually 2022, he says, you know, the party dominated China has little to do with classical China, which looked inward. Um, the, Chinese com the Chinese Communist Party is the new East India Company. Now that's going pretty far. But there's a question of, you know, but that's clearly a question. We see it in the news today, so we really have to think about it as we think about these various um, types of universalism. So now let me just introduce to you uh, the thinker who is going to be the center of my talk today. Um, this is someone named Zhao Tingyang, who's very famous. He's even come, I think he is mentioned in that um, India Times or uh, Times of India article uh, that I that I just sounds that I just cited, um, but he's a Chinese thinker, Chinese philosopher of empire. Um, now this is a new group of people who have come up and are saying, you know, we want to revive our Chinese traditional vision of the world order, and that is going to be better than our contemporary world order, which is dominated by the United States. Uh, and you see his dates here, he's a fairly young thinker. His works have been translated into English recently and uh, German and French. Um, and so he's been getting some traction uh, around, around the world. And I'll be focusing primarily on, 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 on his work today. So one of the questions I'm going to ask um, is how does recent Qian Xia theory connect to Marxism and the Chinese Revolution? Because we have to realize that one of the things when we think about China and we see the red everywhere is, is really how do we think about China today in relation to the Chinese Revolution, right? That is one of the questions that constantly come up. And it's something that's there for Zhao Tingyang as well. Um, and it's something we have to think about when we say, for example, Chinese Communist Party. Um, how communist is the Chinese Communist Party today is a big, is a, is a big question, right? Because they've got to say they're socialist, um, and yet, you know, are they? And and 
how does that make a difference? And when we come to Marxist criticisms of China, uh, that'll often be the question that they really focus on. They'll say, hey, wait a second, you guys are not communists anymore, so, you know, why should we take what you're saying seriously, right? That's going to be one of the questions. While the other criticism is the opposite, right? The other criticism of China is, hey, they're all Marxist author or authoritarianism. So what we have to do is say, well, which, how do we negotiate ourselves, you know, between these two, these two positions, right? Okay, so some goals of today's presentation. So I bring the contemporary Chinese philosopher Zhao Tingyang Qianxia into dialogue with Hegel and Marx to show how it could point to a, po a post-capitalist future, um, but it would need to change somewhat significantly. Now I proceed by combining two aspects of Zhao's theory. One is ontology in the form of the one-many problem. He's going to talk, well, explain that in a second. And history where such categories unfold. Now, the Japanese experience should cause some concern to Zhao and his followers. And I think that's something that they need to think a little more about. I think Japan, the Japan-China comparison often doesn't come up. Um, and I think it really should, um, because there's, as we'll see, there's, a, there's, some, there's some overlap. Now, Zhao would need to address the issue of capitalism as if, if he was to respond to his Marxist new leftist crit critics. critics such as Lin Chun, I'll that'll talk about that. Okay, so as um, Bitasta uh, explained, um, this is all part of this book that I've recently uh, published called The Politics of Time in China and Japan. And I call it Back to the Future, not just because of the movie that was back in the 80s, but, but also because I see all of these narratives, um, a lot of the narratives that Chinese and Japanese are using are, they're going back. They're always saying, I'm going back to Tianxia, I'm going back. But what I think is really happening is as they go back, they're actually thinking of a new future, right? They're actually, when they're drawing on the past, they're trying to push that past into the future. So Tianxia, for example, all under heaven, is supposed to be a new world order for the future, right? And so that's um, how, how I'm sort of conceiving this uh, Okay, so Tianxia theory has to face some fundamental questions, and what are its conditions of possibility? Is it merely a subjective construction? So that's another criticism of Tianxia, which is that it's a great idea, right? But, but what does it really mean to talk about a unified world order, right? So first, to contextualize uh, Tianxia, we have to talk about the transformations of Chinese nationalism. What's happened to Chinese nationalism? So, what I want to say is that there's a global turn in Chinese nationalism, and that's a turn from a more particularist nationalism to a nationalism that seeks to change the world. Okay? So, there are two popular books that I'm going to look at. Um, so, one is China Can Say No, right? Some of you may have heard of this book, China Can Say No. And then more recent one is China Unhappy. And if you look at these two books, which are big bestsellers in China, um, they have very different takes on Chinese nationalism. So here's the first book, China Can Say No. Now, China Can Say No um, is actually a response to this Japanese book, The Japan Can Say No, right? Um, and this, this book had a kind of tragic um, kind of outcome, because it was published in 1989, you know, at the end of the bubble, right? And the bubble was really when Japan was like, everyone was talking about Japan, Japan's going to take over the U.S. and all of that. And after 1989, 1990, that whole discourse sort of dwindled, because the bubble burst. Right? Um, but the Chinese began to see this by the mid-90s, and they began to say, hey, Japan can say no, well, we can say no too, right? And we are going to now say no, and that's going to be what, what this whole book is going to be about. We're going to say no primarily to the United States. Right? But look at what it says with respect to the world and its nationalism, right? It says the U.S. cannot lead anybody. It can only lead itself. Japan can, cannot lead anybody, sometimes not even itself, right? Because by the time you get to 1996, Japan doesn't look very strong. China does not want to lead. 
It only wants to lead itself. So you notice in this depiction, what we have is a very particularist view. It's not a view that says, you know, we want to lead the world. However, there is one thing that's interesting that is that it does not want to lead. So there is the possibility that it could, it, the, you know, that, that's, that it leaves open, but it doesn't get into that. But now look at the other book, China Unhappy. This book has a very different take on the world. He says, saying no expresses the idea that China just wants to govern itself, while unhappiness, this is one of the authors, expresses the idea that China is able to lead the world. Right? So now it is going to lead the world. So, interestingly, it's the same authors who wrote these two books. So there's a global term. So, right? In a situation of isolation and adversity, adversity, the Chinese must ceaselessly strive for self-strengthening and gain even more expansive Lebensraum. Now, of course, when people see this, there's a lot we can talk about because Lebensraum was, sometimes it was used in Germany in a different context and so on. But I think what's really important here is, of course, to say that, hey, they're now saying we need to, we need to now look, start looking outward. Okay. Now, there is a, a context for all of this. And we, should, we shouldn't just, you know, it's very easy to criticize things like this, but we should look that there's a geopolitical context to this global term. And that is clearly the United States. I mean, if you look at the United States military bases, they're all around China. So that's one of the, once one of the issues that are, that are really coming uh, behind a lot of the Chinese thinking. And there's a kind of Cold War that continues in Asia, right? I mean, North and South Korea, um, China and Taiwan, Japan, of course, they are very, very much controlled by the United States. So I think very much the Chinese sort of see this and say, hey, wait a second, you know, we need to, this is, we need to change this, right? I think that's also at the back of their minds. Um, the U.S. empire, you could also say, is sort of dividing um, China and, 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 and a lot of its, a lot, a lot of the other Asian uh, kind of uh, countries. So that's also an issue that comes up here, right? Um, now, China definitely sees India as being closer to the United, uh, United States. Now, this, in very recent uh, history, is now changing somewhat, right? I mean, um, because especially we'll come later to, I mean, how do we think about Russia and Ukraine and all of that sort of complicates uh, the situation here. But we have to situate the various new uh, universalisms coming out of China in this geopolitical context. Because the new universalisms are like, um, you know, the universalist turn of, 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 of China more generally, right? So let's look at some of these various new universalisms in China today. So one is Jiang Shigong, um, someone who we might, uh, who actually teaches at Beijing University. And he explicitly supports Xi Jinping and the thought of the CCP. He says that China has these various stages. One is China stood up, very famous line from Mao, right? Chung Guo Jan Chila, right? China got rich, right? That's supposed to be Deng Xiaoping. And now China became powerful, right? He says these are the three parts, three parts of the history. So once it becomes powerful, well, it's got to, it has to do more than it did before. So this is where he begins to talk about the Chinese empire and we need a new kind of empire. And he says, as a great world power that must look beyond its own borders, China must reflect on her own future. For her important mission is not only to revive her traditional culture. China must also patiently absorb the skills and achievements of humanity as a whole, and especially those employed by Western civilization to construct world empire. Only on this basis can we see the reconstruction of Chinese civilization and the reconstruction of the world order as a mutually reinforcing whole. Now, the key to this, this, para, this passage is this idea of a mutually reinforcing whole. This is a new version of the, of the world that, he's, that they're seeing, right? And he explicitly draws on Tianxia, and in this 
point, he, his position overlaps with Zhao. Now, we will return to Jiang when we discuss the concept of the one. Another person who I've written up about uh, in other places is Wang Hui, who's supposed to be a new leftist, right, and somewhat influenced by Marx and all of that. So in a book I'm completing on Pan-Asianism, I mentioned Wang Hui's recent global turn and his reinterpretation of the Belt Road Initiative. So that's something uh, we can talk about in the discussion. Now, Wang might be relevant here because more than Jiang and Zhao, he stresses the Russian and Chinese revolutions in relation to the present. More than Jiang and Zhao, Wang stresses the necessity of a post-capitalist future as part of the Chinese project. More than either of them, he makes the argument for, um, but more than either of these, Jiang or, or, or Wang, Zhao makes his argument for metaphysical premises, and that's why he's more of a philosopher. So now we'll get to Zhao Tingyao. Um, Tianxia, or all under heaven, and the one many problem. So contemporary Tianxia philosopher, he's, he's a contemporary Tianxia philosopher expressing the global term, a new Chinese world, world, world order. Now my approach to him is going to be both philosophical and historical. So how does philosophy enter history in Zhao's work? Why does he think that a Chinese order would be better than an American or a Western? So for this, we have to ask the question, well, what is Tianxia? Um, some of you may have only heard this term today. Literally, it means all under heaven. And what it usually referred to was the Chinese empire that was consolidated in 220 BC by the Qin emperor, um, but then continued all the way till 1911 in some, with some breaks. Right? So why would anybody want to say that this is a good order, right? What is the point? Why would one, one why would this even be appealing to people, um, apart from it being Chinese? I mean, obviously there's that, uh, that appeal, but that alone wouldn't be able to do it, right? So we have to understand the tribute system, right? Where you had an emperor at the, cent in, at the center, then you had these subjects, and then you had these outside lands, right, who would pay tribute. Um, so, right, you know, so at that time you had Thailand, Ch Korea is perhaps the best case scenario of the, of, the, of the tribute system, right? And the key here is that they recognized um, Chinese culture as superior, right? So the, the argument is that nobody was forcing the Koreans to say, oh, China is, is superior. They themselves took this upon themselves, right? They said, ah, oh, China is the more advanced. We're going to shape our own institutions based on China and all of this, right? So the, the, the idea here is this is a, non, uh, a, a global order of non-domination that allows for particularity. That is, the, that, is, that is the thought, okay. Um, now, the reason that Zhao Tingyang draws on this is partly because of the pandemic and all of these global problems. He says that we need a new world order because our chaotic world order of the nation state is not able to deal with problems such as global poverty, COVID, or any of these issues, right? These are not problems that an individual nation state can solve. Um, and this is an essay that he wrote at the very beginning of the, of the pandemic um, called uh, something like global, the global time of the virus. Right? Um, and in that, um, he says, the pandemic has shown that the basic needs of life are the greatest political and economic social problems. And these are problems that the nation state can't solve. He says, today our globalization is of a low level. It is a rough movement in an anarchic world. There's power and energy, but no order. Low-level globalization cannot produce stable globality. So his point is that you need a world order in order to solve a lot of these problems. And not just because this was, Tenxia is a, is a theory that emerged bef what, much before the pandemic. So they were thinking about things like the environment, global poverty, all of these issues are things that you need a, a, a world order for, right? Um, but it's interesting that the pandemic also sort of made them rethink a lot of this because, of course, when you talk about how the virus moves, all of that, it's something that doesn't respect national borders, right? 
it's a, it's a global movement, right? Um, so he says that following a German thinker, actually named Marcus Gabriel, or Gabriel um, that we need a metaphysical pandemic to confront the COVID pandemic. So what is the metaphysics, right? And, and that's going to be the question that we will, uh, we will look at. So the one many problem, philosophy and politics. So the one many problem is connected to the division of, uh, the, uh, division of power, but Zhao links it to metaphysical roots. And in this way, we get ontology or cosmology to ground politics. So let me begin by quoting a passage that uh, Jiao Tingyang uh, he, he, he writes um, in his recent book on Tianxia. And he says, and this is fundamental because this is fundamentally his concept of the one that he thinks is going to be different. Right? So he says, multiplicity must have the control of some type of frame and only then becomes multiplicity. A multiplicity without any control is merely chaos. Lao Tzu said, the Tao begets one, one begets two, and three gave rise to the myriad things. Then, when there are many new elements in the myriad things, the one must, of course, rethink the one and make it possible to incorporate the changes in the myriad things. At this point, there is a mutual relation between the many and the one. When the many changes, the one must also re respond. One must be more generous and increase its capacity. Change is to produce the large up to the standpoint of no outside. So this might sound like abstract Chinese philosophy, but for him, for, for Zhao, it's very, it has extremely important political implications. Because what it's about is the relationship between the one and the many, many now here talked about in metaphysics in relation to politics. So there is something else that he cites, right, uh, from Confucius, the idea that gentleman harmonizes without homogenizing. So what this means is that there is a one in which each particular thing does not lose its particularity, right? That's the basic idea. And he contends that the Chinese empire in traditional China embody this ideal. So why is that? So here's an example to make this concrete. This is a, um, a series of paintings that the Qing, one of the Qing emperors named Yongzheng painted, right? And this uh, Qing emperor, what he had is a bunch of these different paintings, right? And you look at each of these paintings, what do they represent? Each one of them represent a different culture, right? That's the emperor, it's, this is the emperor, this is all the same emperor. But here he is a bit like a Westerner, there he is like a Taoist, here he's a Mongolian, there he's a Tibetan, and here he's a, Chi he's a, here he's a tra traditional Chinese. So what this was suggesting is that the one emperor can have all these different faces. Face these kind, this kind, these different faces, and therefore embody a number of different particulars. Right now, one could say that this is an ideal. Was it really realized? Those are all kind of issues. But this ideal is the one. This idea of the one that encompasses the many. Right. So as you get another many, the one changes to encom encompass it. Okay. So. In order to understand why this is different from a lot of the Western theories, I'm going to have a little bit of a Hegelian detour here. Um, and that is this question of the one, the Tao begets one, right? It's not something unique to, uh, to obviously Chinese uh, thinking, but there's a question um, that Hegel asks in a different way, when, namely like, why do we have number? Right? Why do we get one? Right? And, and he has a theory about this. If one, two, and three are numbers, then we have a transition from quality to quantity. Right? So if you think about um, the beginning of Hegel's logic, it's all about this. You start with quality, right? something that, that can't really be counted in, 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 in simple terms, uh, and then you get the generation of quantity. Um, and this is one of the things that he does. He, he tries to derive the one. Right? And that's if you look at the logic. 
So it's a very similar kind of trajectory, how you get one. But the reason I'm going to go into this is because you're going to see a very different conception of the one operating in Hegel. One of the things he says is he calls, I'm, I'm not going to, this, this could be a whole different lecture in, in itself. Um, so I'm going to go through this very quickly. Um, so the Hegel's logic begins with being and then Dasein, you know, sort of uh, determinate being. But you eventually get to the one defined as the self-relating void. So the one he wants to say is the self-relating void because it can't have anything within it, right? If it has anything within it, you already have two. And so then he shuts, the, the one has to then shut out that void, void itself because if the one and the void are two, then that can't, that's already two, so it has to shut it out. But then you get another one, right? Because you get another self-relating void and you keep, you keep getting many ones that way and according to, to Hegel's logic, right? So this foreshadows the transition from quality to quantity because the limit of each one is just another one. And the whole point here is that each one is identical, right? Um, there is a difference without a change in quality, right? Because if you take one, each number is supposed to be the same. This eventually gives rise to the series one, two, three. So why is the dialectic of the one relevant to politics, right? We're, now I'm asking this now in, in both, both the Hegelian and the, the Jiao Tingyang framework. So in Hegel's dialectic, of the one appears early in the logic, so one might, it might be overlooked to those readers who are not interested in metaphysics. However, the transition to quantity is crucial because the idea of the one and abstract unity is crucial to the political notion of solving, right? Because after all, you have one as the, the sovereign, you can't en en encompass the other. Hegel's ideal state attempts, attempts to bring quality and quantity together along with the one and many. That's his, another project. Now, Marx and others criticize um, and, and write of the relationship between a unified state and, and the citizens where a person is represented abstractly. So each citizen is, is the same, even though there are all these differences, right? The state is not able to grasp that. Uh, here again, there is an indifference to quality. We also see this indifference to quality in Marx's concept of exchange value, which is opposed to concrete use value, right? Uh, in Hegel's political economy, uh, use itself has an abstract dimension. That's another issue. So now let's look at Lao Tzu's conception of one, which Zhao describes, right? So there's a movement from the one to the many in Lao Tzu as well, but with difference from the Hegelian model. The Tao is infinite, but it envelops rather than shuts out everything. So it's, an, it's a kind of non-exclusivity. So here's a, just a chap, uh, Citation chapter one, 21, right? In the Tao's constituting an entity, ent entity, it is hazy and nebulous. Though nebulous and hazy in the midst, there are forms. Though hazy and nebulous in the midst, there are things, right? So that seems to be a very different logic than Hegelian. In Zhao's view, this vague enveloping one is the unity of Qianxia. Qianxia is an empire, is an empire that is not different to quality, and where the one is responsive to the many. But this past that Zhao finds in Tianxia, especially in the, of the Zhou dynasty and later, um, but later as well, is really a future, right? Because it's going to be what he thinks is to come. So Jiang Shigong expresses something very similar, right? He says, um, he says that Western culture is, attempts to resolve conflict by returning to the base positions. The Chinese solution is precisely to absorb all positive elements from throughout the world from its basis in Chinese civilization and tradition, and therefore to promote a modern transformation of Chinese civilization and tradition, ultimately creating a new order for human civilization that both transcends and absorbs Western civilization. So somehow Western civilization is going to be a moment, right, of this new order according to this. So the natural world turns into a kind of politics of the not yet. Tianxia remains an ideal until the natural world converges with the political world. This is Zhao Tingyang. So why doesn't it converge now? We could ask that question. Because there's no Tianxia uniting the world, right? That's the thing. Tianxia is actually almost realizing a logic of nature already for him, right? From this perspective, Tianxia embodies the cosmological one and could be understood as part of a moral teleology of nature. 
Such discourses are not completely new, and those who study Japan might have a sense of deja vu. So that's one of the problems. So is China turning Japanese, right? That's going to be one of the things. If we, if, if we, if we of course, if I mention this to my Chinese friends, they get very upset, uh, especially a lot of the, the leftists. But it's something that one has to uh, ask, right? So more than a century ago, Fukuzawa Yukichi made the opposite point with respect to Tianxia. He argued that it was precisely when China was not united that it allowed freedom. The unity of Tianxia for Fukuzawa was the beginning of despotism, unlike Japan, right? So he was trying to argue that Japan actually had the better, the, you know, this has been going on for the longest time, the Chinese and Japanese constantly saying, oh no, our past is, is actually better. Um, now, unity is thought of a, now unity is thought of as a positive trait. But the unity is non-exclusive and, product, and, and productive of a series without shutting out others, right? That's supposed to be the Chinese response. But let's look at the Japanese case, right? Nishida Kitaro is a good example. He's part of the Kyoto School, who I, I think uh, Bitasta mentioned is uh, you know, one of the books I edited. Um, so he wrote in 1945 about the Japanese empire in the following way. And I'm not going to read this whole quote, but um, I am going to say that he's talking about the emperor in Japan and the empire, and he says, but I believe that the imperial house goes beyond these subjects and is placed in the world you know, that limits itself by bringing the one as a totality and the singular many into a contradictory unity in itself. So this is Nishida's idea of the one many. But where is this one many realized? He thought it was realized in the Japanese empire. But we now know that that was a pretty imperialist empire. Um, so this, again, is the worry. Could China avoid the Japanese path, right? Because the thing with China is the history is not played out. We don't, we don't completely know where it's going to go. Zhao would claim that China, unlike Japan, was an empire that encompassed difference. Here is argument is similar to some others. I don't want to engage into whether Zhao's discussion of the porous empire is historically accurate, but examine its potential as an ideal for the future. It is an ideal of a one that is dialectically related and mutually constituted by the many. In this case, when China becomes Tianxia, it ceases to be the China that it was before. Right? If we have to follow his logic, that would be what follows. So now, how do we realize this? Can it be realized? Again, the problem of imperialism. Does Tianxia merely cloak Chinese nationalism, which is based on exclusive oneness? In this case, the inclusive one would be a mere ideological veneer. As it stands, Tianxia theorists cannot enter the address this fully because they don't really understand the problems or deal with the problem of different nationalism. Tianxia theorists rarely are address the Marxist tradition or probe the problem of the third world. Zhao at times draws on this idea of anti-imperialist nationalism, but this poses the question of whether imperialism still exists today. And here we could look at Panitch and Gindin's book on imperialism and American imperialism. So let's look at some of the passages where Zhao does talk about third worldism. He says, even though there are some new ideas in their theories, none of these thinkers are able to adequately respond to Mao Zedong's three worlds theory, which directly addresses the problem of global inequality, right? So this is Zhao sort of making a gesture towards Mao. We find that the weaker party's counter strategies can always have a certain destructive effect on imperialist order. This again sounds a little Maoist, right? This world ideal is obviously not aimed at systematizing a new authoritarian power operating within a trin the Trinitarian logic of global capitalism, technology, and comprehensive services. So here again, you see him saying, no, 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 it's not going to be the same. It's going to be different. Now, the question, of course, is how? So the next problem is capitalism. And here we, I come to a, Marx, a Marxist critique of Zhao Tingyang. And this is Lin Chun, who uh, is actually now in England. So Lin Chun contends, and her criticism of Chen Xia, is that it can do nothing against capitalism and is actually complicit in globalization. She contends that Tianxia and Confucianism are toothless against capitalism. 
uh, that it basically doesn't do much. So Lin's point is important because it is possible that a world order governed by China would be better than one governed by the United States, even if the world remains capitalist. But this would not be a radically new order. Lin Chun contends, um, so the Tianxia discourse is relatively silent about the problem of capitalism. And, um, but Zhao does make some comments, some so scattered comments. So in seeking to find a concept of class applicable around the world, many thinkers actually obscure the ways that international exploitation can be even more insidious than national exploitation. So these are one of the scattered comments that one could look at in his work that, that might say, well, maybe we can then talk about why we need to think about this global perspective. Then he talks about a global justice, right? He says, the world needs a new ontological order out of the system of international politics in order to establish global justice. And to control the irrational development of technology and capital, the world needs to become a space for security, peace, and communal, communally shared life. Right? Again, these are generally ideals that we might accept. And he would say that that's why we need this new world order. So now we come to the problem of capitalism and technology, right? Because this is another issue. How do we get, how, how do we think the relationship between them? And how do we think the relationship between technology and something maybe in the future? So a very easily overlooked factor, and this again, Zhao, um, in this predic predicament is that the logics of modern technology and capitalism are not in agreement with the logics of modern politics. The developmental logic of modern technology and capitalism is aimed at realizing a maximal degree of global interconnectedness. But the logic of modern politics is geared towards dividing the world along the lines set by hegemonic imperialism. So this is the problem here. So the question is, how do you develop um, a new kind of global order that would be adequate to and maybe sublate or negate the logic of technology and capitalism. I think that's the, that's the real question that he's posing. So he further contends that modern technology and capitalism have become the grave diggers of modern politics. Now, how does that work? That's something I'm not going to be able to answer completely in this talk, but it is something that I would be happy to uh, engage in the, in the question and answer, because I think that would bring us fully into the uh, sphere of Marxist politics. So to answer the question of whether something like Tianxia philosophy is toothless or not, we have to get into the problem of the, the, the relationship between capitalism and philosophy. Does Tianxia philosophy have a, a role to play in the critique of capitalism and the creation of a different future. The idea of a world order beyond the present would only make sense as a theory of re-globalization, a new one which confronts the present, right? So I think that's the thing. It has to be a re-globalization. It's not the negation of globalization, but a new globalization. And the problem is that the, the political structure of the world is not adequate to this task, right? From these perspectives, Tianxia does posit a world beyond capitalism even though it doesn't always understand itself in this way. So one of the things I'm saying is that Tianxia sometimes doesn't understand its own conditions of possibility. So here, of course, the role of the nation state is crucial. Zhao and Tianxia theory are sometimes criticized for being nationalist. Could they invoke a third world nationalism, a nationalism of self-negation? The result of, of that is this movement could be a co- Post of to it could be a post-capitalist world where the relationship between the one and many is reconstituted such that they are responsive to one another. The problem is that unlike Gramsci or even Mao, Zhao does not seem to have a concept of the national popular or a popular nationalism. Now, empire and nation are part of the contradictions of Tianxia. Tianxia develops a theory of unit, unity and multiplicity appropriate to empire, right? And that's the pre-modern empire. However, the means to realize Tianxia appears to be the nation state, right? Because how do we get from there? You, even, even if you're going to be transnational, you're going to have to start with the nation state. That's the only politics we have at this point. 
unless you want to hope for, you know, going from NGO to, to, to global politics. Consequently, since the 20th century, China has faced the problems of unity and multiplicity. Think today of Tibet, Xinjiang, and Hong Kong, which are each experiments in unity and multiplicity. So one of the things that has to happen, I think, in China is that China is going to have to resolve these problems uh, in order for it to be, to, for us to really think about Tianxia as a global order to be um, something that we can believe in or even that seem plausible. So let me now conclude by summarizing some of the points we've made. So what do the the above comments about capitalism mean for Tianxia theory and, Jia, and, and Zhao's in particular. Tianxia theory becomes something like a regulative ideal. Uh, most of you may be familiar with this. The idea comes from Kant, right? The idea of a regula regulative ideal is something that, you know, you're supposed to be moving towards, right? Following Jacques Bidet, um, he's a French Marxist, we could, uh, however, say that this ideal is not merely utopian, but parts exist in the world today in the form of transnational institutions. So what we have today, and Zhao has already said this in, in, in some of the citations, is that we have a form of what he calls weak globalization. We have globalization in the form of, you know, global capitalism um, and, and certain legal structures, IMF, et cetera, et cetera, that are required for global capitalism to function. However, we don't have structures to bring economy under, under collective control, right? And that, of course, would require a transformation of the first type of globalization, right? So that's, so we almost need a globalization against globalization. So this enables its theorists, right, to go against the contemporary Chinese state. So this is potentially, right, um, to the extent that the state is not involved in creating an alternative to the existing system, right? So this is the problem that I see Tianxia it could go in both directions, right? Tianxia, as it is now, the, one of the dangers is it could legitimate what the Chinese state is doing, right? Because you could say, hey, look, Belt Road Initiative is what it's doing. But I think the other way it could go is that people could say, hey, wait a second. What you're doing is, is actually feeding into the present system of globalization. So then you could use Tianxia against it. So I think I'm, what I'm, I'm wondering whether that could happen. China and Tianxia theorists might have to return um, to earlier narratives of transnational resistance to imperialism while rethinking them in the context of a neoliberal world. So what do I mean by this? Um, those of you who are familiar with recent debates in Marxism uh, will be familiar with the big debates about imperialism, right? Um, Lenin, of course, famously said imperialism is the highest stage of capitalism. But more recently, Western Marxists have decided to reject the concept of imperialism. They say, well, what do, who needs imperialism now? We've got global capitalism. Um, and even Hardin Negri's very famous book, Empire, said there's no imperialism anymore, right? Now, I think we need to rethink such claims, right? And say that there, there is imperialism, but it's not the imperialism that it used to be, right? What we have now is an imperialism that is um, something that is quite different uh, in the sense that it's not direct colonization, but it's often making the world safe for global capitalism, right? And in which certain capitals are, are the most uh, dominant. Finally, Tianxia theorists would need some notion of ca how capitalism points beyond itself. How does it make possible a new notion of the one, right? And that's something that I'm going to leave open today because it, it would then get us into discussions of, of, of Marxist theory. But I think some of the problems here are connected to the problem of technology, right? Uh, and what technology does to labor, does technology allow for a certain kind of other possibilities of social org organization and so on, and what kind of social movements would be required to realize that. And so with that, um, I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. We'll uh, take a few questions. Yeah. Um, thank you for a very interesting talk. And many of the things you talked about is things that I've kind of seen 
on street level in China as tendencies. But one thing that remained unclear to me is that how much is this, uh, these, are these political thinkers, uh, uh, to what extent are they interpreting uh, the policies or influencing the policies? Is there like, um, are they doing both or are they mainly interpreting or are they actually having a lot of political influence on China's, um, um, how, how they're shaping their future policies? That's a good uh, question. And I think um, the answer would have to differ based on which intellectuals we're talking about, right? I think these, a lot of the intellectuals would like to influence the policies. But for example, the person I'm dealing with today, Zhao Tingyang, is actually a um, professor at the People's University. So, but the People's University is obviously very connected to, to the party. But he's not someone who wants to say that he is interpreting Chinese policy. He definitely doesn't. And that I know because I've talked to him. And in fact, asked him, you know, because I said, hey, you've got Tian Xia happening at the same time as the government is talking about Belt Road. Now, you know, I think you can, as an intellectual historian, I think they're part of the same milieu. But, I don't think that Zhao would like to explicitly see himself as reflecting that. Uh, now, I think he would like to influence politics, but the extent to which he actually is remains unclear, right? And how, right? Because a lot of times, as you know, uh, the government can take these ideas and use parts of them to legitimate what they're doing anyway. So I think that, that those kind of issues come in here, right? Um, this, is an, this is an odd question. I would like to know, you know, Zhao uh, propounds a philosophy uh, which uh, probably becomes a basis for some activities within the Chinese society, uh, Chinese government. But how much of this is drawing from popular, uh, you know, perceptions of where China is and where it should be getting to? So when it came to popular visions of what China, where China should be getting to, um, I think we can partially use as a marker um, those two books I mentioned, right? Because Zhao's work is somewhat intellectual. Right, so I think it's very popular among students and um, faculty in the humanities, for sure. However, is it popular beyond that, right? Are you going to find it, you know, on the streets and so on? There I'm a little bit doubtful. However, the idea, the book, China and Happy, now that resonates much more broad broadly. Right, just like China could be known, those were those were bestsellers, right? Um, and so, so the idea of China having to maybe start concerning itself with the wider world, that I think is in the popular consciousness. So, to that extent, Zhao is connected to some to a movement in the larger popular consciousness, and that's why he can be recognized. As a, as a kind of public intellectual, right? Um, now, the intricacies of Zhao's Tianxia theory, I don't think are going to be that popular. But he does write like his, his COVID essay. Now that's on the internet. Everyone can read that, right? Um, and so there, that is something that, so I think, you know, when we come to the popular level, level of popular culture, I think some of these things are, going to be there in more diluted form um, rather than in their more um, in the more philosophical expression. I don't know if that got answered your question. Anyone has any question? Yeah. Um, if I understand the, the interpretation of Jianjia correctly, it would be that China is leading the world but not because it's forcing others but that because others are emulating China's example. Um, 
In, in a way, isn't this what partly the United Nations is trying to achieve? That lead by consensus and by by discussion and vote of the members and um, then how does this relate to China trying to reject uh, parts of the United Nations institution? So that's a that's a good question. I think um, I think you're right. It is it is the idea of China trying to lead by consensus is definitely true. Um, now, I think what uh, Zhao would say is that the United Nations does not actually represent complete consensus, right? Um, and it represents largely American hegemony, right? I think is what he would say. So he would say that the Tianxia perspective would be one that actually does respect difference, right? Um, now, this is where I think that for Zhao's idea to develop further, he would have to make the critical side of his work much more apparent. And I've tried to stress those places, right? So where he, where he develops a critique of capitalism, for example. That would be very relevant, right? Because the United Nations does very little to go to overcome capitalism. If anything, it, it is something that, that, that reproduces it. Uh, so then you get all the global problems that Jia, Jiao Tingyang is talking about, such as inequality, environmental degradation, all of these problems that are transnational, uh, cannot be dealt with by nation states nor the United Nations. So if, if we were to think of a German counterpart, it would be Kant, right? The world republic, right? Where, because the United Nations can't really do anything. But Kant had an idea, we could have a world republic, right? So, so that's where the, the world republic actually can do things. That's sort of where he's getting at. That's sort of where he's getting at. That's what he's getting at. That, that, that all of a sudden we're going to have a tianxia that, that where you actually have a global, global institution um, to, de to deal with things. Now, I think you're right that there is, if we start thinking about the way in which you have recognition, right? Uh, without coercion. One of the places you see this, of course, is this whole soft power discourse, right? And that's where, you know, in 1995, the government was very concerned, right? And all these Chinese going to see the movie Titanic, right? And uh, they were saying, well, why can't we, when, when is it going to be that we have people all over the world rushing to see like Chinese film, right? Now there, now that of course is the government and not Jiao Tingyang. But I'm thinking that there's something like that behind, and this is again where popular culture and, uh, and, and his theory might overlap. So somehow the Chinese model has got to have a kind of traction. And for that, um, I think the, the whole problems, the internal problems are going to have to be resolved. Because now when we immediately think of China, the Chinese model, there are these sore thumbs that, that, that jump out at us, right? And, and then we don't know if we want to do you know, we want to get ourselves into something like that. But I think that that's going to be the crucial thing, right? Because China as it is, is, you know, you remember when we talk about pre-modern China, Tianxia was China and that was the world. So the first thing you've got to do is sort of show how that world is working, right? And, um, and I think that's, that's sort of the, the, the task for them ahead, I think. Thank you. Sir, uh, my question is a bit uh, off the topic, means not related to this. In general, like uh, we know that Hyung Sang had uh, visited India and then he took some Indian philosophy there. Who is this? Ash Ash Ashwenza, yeah. So, uh, where does that uh, philosophy or re religion in general uh, stand for in today's uh, China, like for uh, general public and for government there? So, okay. Um, yes, you're right. That is a question that does not relate to my talk today. But luckily for me, my first book is sort of on that. Um, so, um, so, the, it, so, and I say sort of, because um, Xuanzang um, took, went to India and brought back a lot of 
Buddhist philosophy, Buddhist scriptures, right? And those Buddhist scriptures are extremely significant for Chinese culture. Um, so first, the first way is just in the language, because you have to think about it. The text that Xuanzang brought, they're not in, they're, not, they're in Sanskrit. So the first thing you have to do is translate those terms into Chinese. Now, the Chinese vocabulary expanded immensely based on, on those translations. So just based on that, and that's not really my area of study. But there is a place, because you asked about the contemporary, there is a place where that Xuanzang's translations begin to meet modern China, and that's in early 20th century. That's in the late 19th, early 20th, 20th century. When a lot of Chinese intellectuals start looking at the Yogacara Buddhism, which is what the kind of Buddhism that he was developing, which is in English sometimes called mind-only Buddhism or consciousness-only Buddhism, right? Vignapati, Vignapati Mantra or something, yeah, I think is, is what it is. And that, of course, that, that the Chinese intellectuals saw that as being very modern. Right? Why is that very modern? Because it stresses consciousness. So what Zhang Taiyan, subject of my first book, was, was about, what all he said is you look at Yogacara Buddhism and they've already done what Kant has done. Right? Kant has all these categories, but Yogacara is, is, is able to do it all and say that, you know, the, the world that we produce is produced by consciousness. Right? That's what he says. So that, that's why there's some who you would even say, so I was part of this project um, that was looking at all of the different ways in which Chinese intellectuals drew on Yogacara Buddhism, right? Which is then the translations of Shrenza. And we were going to call the book The Indian Roots of Chinese Modernity. Now, they eventually said that that's too polemical. So we didn't, we didn't have that. Um, but, but there is something we could say. I mean, that that was very important that moment. Uh, and then it became really important for revolution as well, because if you think about it, when you say everything is in consciousness, that gives you the idea that, well, we can change the world, right? It began to be a revolutionary morality, right? Because you say the self is nothing, well, now we can now, you know, uh, have a kind of resistance and all of that. So those are some of the ways. Now, that's all early 20th century. As we go, go on further, it's harder to find that influence. Um, so when you get to the Mao period, right? When you get to the Mao period, you don't have, you have some of these same ideas, but they're not connected to Yogacara in the same way because Yogacara becomes idealism, right? Because now we need materialism. Yogacara, all Buddhism gets thought of as idealism, although some then began to say, no, no, no. People who want to support Buddhism say, no, no, Buddhism is actually materialism. So now we get into another kind of thing. And I think now we're, we're still having those debates. In, in, in China today, yeah. Does anyone have, okay. I, uh, we can take this as the last question because the coffee is getting cold. We can continue. Yeah, so uh, you mentioned about the uh, Cold War uh, is still continuing in uh, Asia and how the uh, United States is involved in uh, various countries militarily. So, uh, but the India-China conflict is actually much older than this. Like, uh, in 1960s, when all of that started, India was a socialist country and it wasn't very close to the United States. So, is there a special ideological conflict between India and China that is still going on? Well, I think, I think the Cold War, I don't know if we should call it the Cold War, um, but I think for understanding contemporary India-China relations, I think it's impossible to do so without the United States, without thinking about the, the role of the United States. Uh, and, I'd say, and I think that's why we need to make uh, a distinction between the problems in the 60s um, and the problems today, even though there are continuities and clearly the memory, I, the memory issue is there. But um, because I also do work on China, Japan, there the memory issue is much more serious because you know you have things like the Nanjing massacre and so on and all of these things that and the, and the and the role that the Japanese government plays in all of that i think that the possibility of a rapprochement between china and japan is much more difficult to imagine than a rapprochement between china and india 
Now, I think the India issue, really, one has to think about the Modi government, right? And I think, and what, and, and its role in all of this, and, and, and how it's depicting China, how the, how the Indian media, the media is depicting China. Because a lot of times, the Indian media is depicting China in a way that's very similar to the United States. Um, and that's where you begin to have the Cold War ideology coming in, right? And I don't think that was quite the case in the 60s. Because after all, they were all part of the Bandung, they were part of a third world unity until a certain point, right? Um, and then I think there were certain tensions, there are various interpretations about why that, you know, war broke out and why there was a split at that point. Uh, some argue it has to do with leadership in the third world, a lot of all those kind of issues. But now I don't think it's that. Now I think um, it's 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 there have been new conflicts, uh, and I think that the United States plays a, a key role. And I think it's it's a very important for China to try to overcome this, um, because if China is going to try to talk about some kind of unity in Asia, right, or something like that, well, definitely it has to solve the Japan problem and the India problem. And I think I think the India problem is actually one that's solvable. Um, the Japan problem is much more difficult. Um, and so, and so I, I don't know if that gets at, at your question, but I think that's where I think the Cold War comes in, something like the Cold War, because you get this idea of China, the image of China as, as just an authoritarian kind of communist state. And I think that vision is there in, in, in India quite a bit now. Because, in, and as you, were, as you pointed out, in the 60s, it's, it's hard to make that, because if India itself sees itself as socialist, it's hard to say, oh, well, you're a communist, right? Well, now that, that discourse can work. Oh, oh, they're communists, so there's no freedom, right? Uh, there's no democracy, that kind of, that kind of idea, right? That's, that's almost these kind of snippets that pass, o pass over for, for knowledge, right? And I think, and that's part of the problem. Now, on the other side, on the Chinese side, you might also have, um, certain misconceptions that need to be dealt with, mainly, you know, the backward country, that kind of thing. Um, but I think that's China is slightly, there's, you know, there's a, there, there's unfortunately very little, um, interaction, uh, between these countries and, and especially even, even, even scholarly. I mean, cause I was, when I'm in China, one of the things I was trying to do is sort of see, well, are there like South Asia departments? And they're very few. Um, there are very few Chinese who try to say, well, let's learn these languages, the uh, Indian language. Now, now it's starting. Right now, we're beginning to see a little more, and so I, one hopes that um, you know in the future, as you know, understanding increases between the two countries, we can then sort of go beyond uh, some of these uh, some of these disputes. Right. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we'll probably call it a day, and uh, we can continue the discussion in the reception hall. Thank you, Professor Virin Murthy. Thank you. Uh, it was a very insightful lecture, and a lecture of this nature is so rare to hear in our institute. And we also like to thank Prof uh, Dr. Uday Balakrishnan for facilitating this lecture. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank we'll you. We'll see you again. Thank you. Thank you.